Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to these American coincidences, these British American coincidences blew my mind and well, we're going to see what coincidences there are because I don't really know any coincidences in terms of, I mean, I'm thinking of coincidences in general and I can't really think of any famous ones. If I actually like had a, like, I, I mean, I was sort of reminded of one and maybe I'd remember more, but there's obviously some famous coincidences, but I just can't clock them. Um, I mean, I guess like stuff like The Simpsons predicting the future, that's kind of a coincidence. Not really, but it's somewhat is um, that sort of stuff. But anyway, we're going to check this out and see. Hopefully going to enjoy. Link's also in the description to my Patreon where I've just reacted to... Um, what film was it? Classic film. With Morgan Freeman. Mate, my memory is terrible. I've literally just been looking at it. Shawshank or The Shawshank... The Shawshank Redemption. I've reacted to it all through and I loved every second of it. It was an incredible film and I think I'm going to do Forrest Gump next. I've already reacted to the Back to the Future trilogy, Black Hawk Down, many other films and many more to come. Series as well. If you're interested, links are there. If not, I mean, I have tried posting like sort of cut up sections of the film reactions on YouTube and it just gets blocked. So I apologize for that. But yeah, we're going to jump into this anyway and see some of these coincidences. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond. And one of those memos pertains to wild coincidences. <laughs> Let's hear them. Specifically, coincidences that had both countries at their very heart. You see, since moving to the United States, and particularly since starting this job, my research has revealed a series of serendipitous moments in our shared history. Moments that came about through confusion, lost memos, and even tragedy. After all, Halloween may have come and gone, but for me, spookiness has always been synonymous with the month of November. Number one, the clocks go back and the days grow shorter. Number two, Guy Fawkes happens, at least in the UK. And number three, it was this month, 43 days from the end of the year in which a certain YouTube sensation was born. I can feel your pets howling as we speak. On a side note, my American wife's birthday is 43 days into the year, so you could say that I'm no stranger to such glitches in the Matrix. All that to say that November seemed like the perfect time to make this video. Especially since my subscriber count grows ever closer to 666666 subscribers. If you're not one of them, please rectify that now. In the meantime, here are four British-American coincidences that get hotter the further you go. But first, chocolate. Earlier this week on Halloween, millions of you no doubt answered your doors to children dressed as their favourite superheroes, such as Spider-Man or Taylor Swift. Assuming those Halloweeners correctly enunciated the words trick and or treat, chocolate might be among their rewards. And in this country, that chocolate could take the form of mounds and almond joy, as referenced in my recent video, Six British Things That Are Actually American. I will link to that video at the end. Why am I German now? But sometimes, buried beneath the more ubiquitous candy, you might find a wrapper bearing the words York Peppermint Patties. And York Peppermint Patties are one of those candies that sort of passed me by. In fact, before I even became aware of them, I stopped eating added sugar altogether. But as a person born in Britain, I... Bro, I need to stop eating added sugar, man. I was so healthy before and I've just felt almost like fell into a hole of just eating snacks all the time. I mean, I'm, a, I'm sort of good for now, but it's just, I just want to sort of cut it out before... My metabolism slows down pretty much. I am at least curious about one thing, its name. You see, the UK has a chocolate bar bearing the name York, that yep. being the utterly... This used to have... <laughs> I think it's banned now, but it used to have only for men or something like that. On, like, the packaging, only for men. or just some craziness. And I grew up with a York bar like that, and now... Or a Yorkie bar like that. And, yeah, now that's not going to be accepted. But before, the bar, the bar was only for men, you know, so... It's crazy that that was the the advertising though. Unrelated Yorkie bar. After looking a little deeper, I discovered that the two brands have some oddly specific things in common. Firstly, they were both named for the city of their origin. The Yorkie, originally a product of English confectioners Roundtree, was conceived in York, England, hence the name. And America's York peppermint patties, initially produced by the York Cone Company, originated in York, Pennsylvania, hence the name. Damn. But there's something you should know. The word originally was doing a lot of heavy lifting in the previous two sentences. 
because both York peppermint patties and the Yorkie were later acquired by multinational corporations. Nothing unusual about that, of course, since this is the reality for many confectionery brands. What makes it weird is the timing. While York peppermint patties had been around since 1940, they didn't achieve national status until the mid-70s. And guess which other chocolate bar hit UK shelves at that time? That's right, the Double Decker, but also the Yorkie. <laughs> the latter would spend much of the 1980s under the ownership of Roundtree Macintosh before that company was controversially acquired by Nestle in the summer of 1988. As for the York Cone Company, after briefly falling into the hands of Britain's Cadbury, it was ultimately acquired by a company based 35 miles from York, PA, Hershey. <laughs> History will note that this too occurred in the sweet summer of 1988. The Phantom And as Dennis. it happens, it was around that time that what I started that? collecting comics. Chief among these was the British anthology. Is it Dennis the Menace? Beano, I know about this. They, they've made, they made Dennis the Menace, right? The Beano, created by publishers DC Thompson, no relation to DC think. Comics. In fact, that name similarity is but a mere case of happenstance compared to what I'm about to tell you. Because the extraordinary coincidence in question concerns the Beano's most famous character. Back in 1951, Come DC on. Thompson unveiled a new personality called Dennis the Menace. I don't know who's that old though. I thought Dennis the Menace was maybe like a 90s show that then I sort of watched when I grew up. Yes. The story goes that the name came about after the comics editor overheard the following lyrics in a long forgotten music hall production. Dennis the Menace from Venice. The mischievous boy known for his horizontal red and black stripes and dog Nasher debuted on March 12th, 1951. He was such an instant hit that Dennis the Menace quickly became the face of the Beano, a distinction he held in my own childhood collection and to this very day. And at this point, my American viewers might be thinking, wait, we have a comic strip called Dennis the Menace. What's going on? And it's true. In the US, Dennis the Menace is another troublesome child. Oh, wait, so the, the Dennis the Menace in the UK is that's not even known in the US. Oh, so they just made a different version of him in the US. Child known for his horizontal blue and black stripes and dog rough. Surely then one comic strip must have influenced the other. Uh, no. The American version was in fact conceived independently of the British one. Furthermore, the strip's creator, Hank Ketchum, named Dennis the Menace after his own son, also Dennis, who was labelled a menace by Hank's then wife. <laughs> Furthermore, Ketchum was unaware of the British version when he launched his own for the first time. And this is made all the more believable by the fact that it was launched on the very same day, March 12th, 1951. Holy Since shit. then, the UK version has become known in some international markets as just Dennis and Nasher to avoid confusion with the American one, which simply goes by Dennis in the UK. Bizarre twain Back events. when people still looked like paintings, the world was enveloped in a whirlwind of scientific discovery. For one, Copernicus theorised that the Earth orbits the Sun as opposed to the other way around. And Sir Isaac Newton wrote his laws of motion despite not having any legal qualifications. What a genius. <laughs> and the English astronomer Edmund Halley had a <coughs> celestial body named after him. Big deal, so did Laurence Olivier. Halley's Comet, which is pronounced Halley's Comet and not Halley's Comet, had been recorded numerous times since 240 BC, but it wasn't until 1703 that good old Eddie, himself born in November, realised it was the exact same comet each time. Posthumously, he would be proven right in 1758 when, as predicted by Halley decades earlier, it showed up in the night sky. With a flyby rate of approximately every 75 years, Halley's Comet is widely recognised as the only only naked eye comet that can show up twice in a person's lifetime. Damn. And one man from Missouri unwittingly took this notion to extreme lengths. Having been born a couple of weeks after the comet's 1835 pass, he would later make the prediction that the comet's return in 1910 would coincide with his death. Not only was he correct, but we have first-hand evidence for everything that I've just told you because that man was American author Mark Twain. Born Samuel Clemens in, ha, what do you know, November 30th, 1835. The renowned author of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer commented in 1909, It is coming again next year, the Almighty has said, no doubt. Now there are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together. They must go out together. So that is the best I could do. There are no audio recordings of Twain's voice. On April 20th, 1910, the comet made its closest approach to Earth, and the very next day, Mark Twain died. Of course, he wouldn't be the first or last author to leave us in the 20th century, which brings us on to this. 
brave new words. You see, another such author was Britain's C.S. Lewis, whose vivid imagination brought us the Chronicles of Narnia and a profound fear of Turkish delight. Given his inclusion on this list, it will probably come as no surprise that his birth certificate also bears the month of November, a word that cannot be spelled without... Uh, no. But it's perhaps even more notable that the 11th month also featured on the certificate of Lewis's death. And you might be thinking, oh, Lawrence, what's so notable about that? People die in November all the time. And that's true, but what makes this case a bit more surreal is that Lewis wasn't the only renowned British author to die that particular November. Or indeed, that particular day. Aldous Huxley, best known for penning the dystopian novel Brave New World, would die several hours after C.S. Lewis in Los Angeles, ironically having migrated to the New World. Unfortunately, however, that little tidbit does not represent the American involvement in this coincidence which only keeps on coincidenting harder and harder. You see, what I forgot to mention is that these two literary juggernauts happened to die on November 22nd, 1963, the date of John F. Kennedy's assassination. <laughs> With the what world's the gaze fuck? largely on the events in Dallas, Lewis's and Huxley's deaths went by largely unnoticed until an announcement was made three days later. November 22nd seems to have it in for British writers with a clockwork orange author. Creepy ass looking front page. Anthony Burgess dying exactly 30 years later. And Kennedy's death almost impacted a future British institution. You see, at the time, the BBC had to grapple with how the earth-shattering news from across the pond would affect the ratings for a brand new science fiction show airing the next Doctor day. Doctor Who? Hey. To give it a chance, they decided to re-air the episode a week later, and the show in question became a huge hit with audiences. That show was Doctor oh, Who, God which damn. will celebrate 60 years later this month. Unfortunately, the inaugural episode's buccaneering producer, Verity Lambert, is no longer around to celebrate it, having herself died November 22nd, 2007. Coincidences are not always fun. Some might even argue that coincidences aren't coincidences at all. But a set of loosely connected events easily explainable by science, but those people have no friends. Given all of the memos that Britain and America lose in the pond, it's inevitable that buried beneath our differences are some unlikely similarities. I can even attest to that in my own life. After all, my lives in both Britain and America began in the month of November. One when I was born, the other when I moved here 15 years ago next week. Stay tuned. <laughs> In the meantime, if you're... Well, I'm sure someone has already said it, but you, sir, are an American treasure. The British and Americans are two great people divided by common tongue. George Bernard Shaw. Before his death, C.S. Lewis said he wanted to die quietly and hoped his death would go unnoticed without fanfare. How do people know this stuff? It's crazy that people have knowledge on these things that are so long ago. Fair enough. Um, well, there we go. That's what coincidences are. Things happening... At the same time, and like, as a kind of similar, they're linked together. That's where we're at. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this reaction. And this actually reminds me, I watched a show on Netflix a few days ago. Of like, it was of this crime. It was a series, not a show. Series, same thing. A crime happening in the same in the same way in four different time periods. And it just kind of reminded me of that. And that was a really good show. But um, yeah, there we go. Hopefully you enjoyed. And until next time, like, subscribe. Peace.